Release the Kraken! Today we don't have greetings. Today we have serious matters to discuss. I am saying this publicly. If they mess the Ironborn up for a second time, I am gonna flip. HBO, please give us the chaotic great joy we deserve. Because after the Euron clusterfuck, we deserve at least a good Dalton. And when I'm saying good, I mean bad. To be honest though, I don't think we will see them very much. I think we will see them choose a side and start the ravings. And this is it. I doubt we will get to see the sack of Lannisport and of Fair Isle. And this is a shame, because Dalton was a chaotic evil and a great character to add, if you ask me. But the Ironborn stayed in the West and the majority of the important events during the war took place outside of the Westerlands. So yeah, there's that. Before we start, I would suggest coffee, tea, food, a hand to hold, I don't know, something, because this episode is big, and also it's two parts. I rambled about the Ironborn during the dance in the beginning, but the bigger part is going to be a theory about the Iron Islands that I'm 99.9% sure are volcanic. So let's have a look at the Iron Islands during Viserys' reign and during the dance first. A small spoiler alert, I would say what side the Ironborn chose in the dance and why, but this is pretty much the only spoiler, I believe, since I doubt we will see more in House of the Dragon. So, from Aegon's conquest and until the dance, the Ironborn were not involved with the rest of Westeros at all. They didn't provoke the Targaryens because dragons, and they did ravings mostly outside of Westeros. Enter Red Kraken. Dalton started rowing at age 5 and by 10 he was going with his uncles to plunder. The places Ironborn went were mostly the Stepstones, the Basilisk Isles and other places on the Summer Sea. By 14 he had sailed as far as Old Geese and had a dozen fights along with four salt wives under his belt. Dalton at around 15 took a Valyrian steel longsword off of a dead corsair. He named the sword Nightfall and people were saying that it was his biggest love. Nightfall right now is held by Haras Harlow, and to be honest, considering its name and backstory, I think Euron will get it to complete the Valyrian set. And this is going to be bad. <laughs> but back to Dalton. The same year his uncle died on a rave, and Dalton got the name Red Kraken when he avenged his death and returned drenched in blood and covered in wounds. Some months after his father, also died, so Dalton returned from the Stepstones to the Iron Islands to claim the Seastone Chair as ruler of the Iron Islands. The first thing he did as Lord the River of Pike was to build longships, forge swords and train fighters. And when they asked him why, he answered, the storm is coming. And this is what I find weird. How did he know that something was off? Why was he so sure? The conversation allegedly took place a year before Viserys' death. Was he so sure that people would have a problem with a female ruler? Had he heard something while on the stepstones? Did he have dreams or some other shit? Because it doesn't make sense for him to be so sure that something will happen. Anyway, somehow he did know something was going on. And a year after, when Viserys died, the first thing Otto did was to send bribes and letters to the lords all over Westeros to gain support for the Greens. And one of the letters was for Dalton, where he offered him a seat on the small council as master of ships. Obviously, Dalton didn't answer back <laughs> until both the Blacks and the Greens presented their offers. All this while Viserys was rotting in his chambers, by the way, because they wanted to be sure they would have support for Aegon before the official announcement that the king was dead. And the only thing I have to say about this is that the Silent Sisters were the real heroes in the situation because they had to tend a three plus days old corpse. In any case, I think that the Greens were kinda stupid in this specific instance. First of all, the Ironborn never cared for the politics of Westeros, they only cared about the return of the old way and the complete banishing of the faith from the Isles. These were their biggest issues. One thing that most sources say is that Dalton, even though very young when the dance started, he was 16, he wasn't stupid. There is no way they would keep him as master of ships after the war if Aegon won, and Dalton for, for sure knew it. Plus, they wouldn't do anything to solve their main issues, because the Reeds and the Westerlands were the main places Ironborn raved, so I doubt the Greens would be okay with the return of the old way. And obviously, 
they wouldn't let them expel the septas and septons again from the island because the high towers had a very close relationship with the faith and the faith was actually a big support during the war. In 37 AC, 92 years before the beginning of the war, Anis had given permission to remove the faith completely from the island, but it has started to be present again almost one century after the event. Now, if the blacks had the upper hand while they supported the greens, they were 99% screwed. Otto asked them to sail from the Isles to King's Landing to battle with Corlys. Corlys was probably the only person who could do them some serious damage. So why travel for days to go to King's Landing to battle for a dude that they didn't care about? If the Riverlands were not a war zone, maybe it could be easier because during the Hor Kings, the bigger rivers were used as routes. But Riverlands, as always, were a war zone and also very divided. Some houses were supporting the Blacks, some the Greens, and the members of House Tully, the ruling house, had also different opinions in the beginning of the war, with the head of the house, Grover, wanting to support Aegon, and Elmo, Oscar and Kermit wanted to support Rhaenyra. And this is where the other chaotic icon, Daemon, comes to play. Daemon said during a council that Otto for sure will ask Dalton to join them, they didn't have navy. But Dalton cared only for blood and fight, so they needed to find a better offer for him. And they did. Rhaenyra said that she only wants the Ironborn to attack their enemies, and I cannot stress enough how clever that was. Dalton was a horny, bloodthirsty teenager, so obviously he would choose the Blacks. But also, every Ironborn would choose the Blacks. They were probably the only place in Westeros at the time that was actively gaining instead of losing. They stayed very close to their home, they raved the richest part of the continent, and they didn't even lose many people since Westerland's army was at the Riverlands fighting. Like a quote from the World Book says, For the better part of two years, the Red Kraken ruled the Sunset Sea as his forebears had done of old. Whilst everywhere in Westeros, great armies marched and clashed and dragons wheeled across the skies and met in bloody battle. Now, after the war was over, Tyland Lannister was Hand of the King and told Dalton to stop the attacks, but Dalton said, nope, not gonna happen. Lady Joanna Lannister began building a new fleet on behalf of her son and head of the house, who was very young at the time, but Dalton's men burnt his shipyard and abducted another hundred women from the, from the Westerlands. Westermen defended Case, though, and slayed Dalton's favorite uncle. Joanna sent a ragtag fleet to discreetly invade Fair Isle, which was a base of the Ironborn, but the Ironborn came on top and Dalton sent the heads of the Lords Prester, Tarbeck and Sir Erwin Lannister to Joan at Casterly Rock as a gift. Lord Dunwin Peak, a member from a very shady house by the way, attempted to rid himself uh, of Allen Velaryon by sending him to end Dalton's mess. Dalton responded by gathering hundreds of longships to Fair Isle and the coasts of the Westerlands and he intended to take over the Sealed Islands and Driftmark, and sack Old Town and Sandspear. Something like that never happened because one of his 22 salt wives, Tess, killed him in his sleep and afterwards took her own life. And after that chaos, a rebellion rose in the Fair Isle, many Ironborn were killed, Ironborn fought each other, because Dalton had only salt wives so he didn't have a successor. Joanna then saw this as a great opportunity to avenge the Westerlands and the raves they had suffered during the war, and she sent her men, along with the fleet of Sir Leo Costain, the Lord Admiral of the Ritz, to the Iron Islands. Two of Dalton's sisters and nine of his cousins were slayed, along with many Ironborn, and Dalton's younger son, Roderick, was taken captives. Roderick was gelded and made into Casterly Rock's new fool. So I think you can see why I think the Ironborn have some of the most interesting storylines. They also have the most interesting history and mythology in Westeros, hands down. They have sea dragons, cursed black weapons, resurrection rituals, because I don't think it was CPR from the start, necromancers, magic hordes, and a completely different and unique religion. And I am here to suggest the theory that the Ironborn were Valyrians before the Valyrians, 
minus the dragon bond. According to Ironborn legend, Naga was the first sea dragon able to feed on krakens and leviathans and drown islands when angry. The Grey King, held by the drowned god, managed to slay her on the shores of the island of Old Wick and built his hall on her bones. Her jaws became his throne and her teeth made his crown. He made her living fire his slave and warmed his hall with it. However, when the Grey King died, the storm god drowned out her fire and the sea took the throne. Only her bones that made the pillars and beams remain. I think we all agree that Naga's bones are not from a sea dragon. They are not even bones from a leviathan or any other animals. They are not bones. The most popular theory is that it's the skeleton of the first ship the Great King uh, made from the demon tree Ig, and I agree with it. It has parallel with trees, it's stone, and we know that weirwood wood with time turns to stone, and Ig is described as a weirwood. Ig, as a name, is a reference to both Ig, the father of serpents in the Lovecraft mythos, and Yggdrasil, the world tree in Norse mythology. And at the roots of Yggdrasil, there was a dragon. So in both stories, we see that reptiles are involved. Martin has said that the ironborn ships are similar to Viking ships. And we know that ironborn ships too had carvings on the front. The Viking longships, owned by kings and chieftains, often had dragon heads in their bow. It offered protection from sea monsters, men, bad weather, and raids along the voyages. Ironborn, like the Valyrians, spread their names in fire, blood, and song. But instead of their dragons, they had their ships. And at that point, it was quite unique, because the first men didn't have that advanced navigation. So Naga, the sea dragon, was the ship. Thing is, they knew what a dragon was and how a dragon looks like. They are talking about living fire and a creature they slayed on all week. And I think it was a normal dragon. They are talking about fire. Considering that myths about ice dragons talk about ice and the dragons we know are connected with fire, it's a little weird for a sea dragon to have fire. And if it wasn't a dragon, then it looked a lot like one, because they said, ah, a sea dragon. But I doubt we wouldn't have more information about fire-breathing sea dragons anywhere else in the world, if they were a thing. And this is where I first thought of Grey Ghost. Grey Ghost, the wild dragon in Dragonmont in Dragonstone, he was pale grey-white, and a very side dragon who avoided people and their work for years. He preferred to feed on fish and was often glimpsed flying low over the narrow sea, snatching prey from the waters. If they hadn't seen a dragon before, but they knew stories about them and saw a dragon so close to the sea, with bluish, greyish, greenish color, when they saw Naga, they were like, oh, a sea dragon. And even if they had seen one before, they were calling her the sea dragon because she liked the sea and was living beside the sea, doesn't necessarily mean that she was a sea monster. We already know that the High Towers and other figures from the Ritz had slayed dragons, at least there are legends and myths. So in this part of Westeros, at this point of the timeline, we had dragons. And my question is, why there? Naga, maybe like Grey Ghost, was shy and went to more isolated place. But we know there were other dragons too in this part of the world. Why? Wild dragons tend to go to volcanoes. Cannibal, Sheep Stealer, and Grey Ghost were in Dragonstone. Fourteen Flames were the source of Valyrian magic and, in extension, dragons. Other stories say about Asai and islands on the Jade Sea, and it again makes sense. Marahai is an island there, and it has two active volcanoes. Dragons being killed in Tarth and in Kraklow. It's pretty logical. Dragonstone is really close, and the dragons were flying there too. So we need a place close to the Ritz, since many dragons will kill there. And Iron Islands is a place like this. It is the perfect place, and we know that Naga was killed there, so she probably was living there too. Iron Islands are most likely volcanic. For starters, there is a caldera between Old Wick, the Holy Island, where Naga was killed, and Great Wick. Our author is obviously familiar with the concept, since he has done it with Marahai. And we know that this island is now actively volcanic. Aaron described Old Wick as having windy hills and cruel black mountains. 
and we are told that the Iron Islands are not very fertile. There is a misconception that all volcanic areas are fertile, and this isn't always true. The reason many volcanic places are extremely prolific is because of the ash that is packed with minerals. Thing is, minerals are not the only specification. There are other conditions a place needs to have, like good climate, non-salty water sources, and original soil with decent consistency. The volcanic islands close to Antarctica aren't that fertile, for example, obviously, since they don't have the best climate. The islands in the South Aegean volcanic arc, again, aren't very green, and I think it's the best example I can give since I am familiar with the landscape. Sadorini soil looks like a mixture of desert sand and lunar rock fragments. The topsoil consists of basalt, volcanic ashes, sand, pumice stone, and a mixture of lava that they call aspa. Aspa is very different from place to place, and Sadorinian aspa is overall poor, infertile, and very dry, even though it is rich in uh, some minerals like iron and magnesium. The soil also has low clay percentage, so it drains fast, doesn't retain enough water, and no water means no nitrogen movement. And no nitrogen movement means no photosynthesis. And this is the case in Old Week, where most likely the crater is, Pike, and in general in the smallest islands of the group. Great Week, Orkmund and Harlow are not as barren. They are actually very forested and mountainous. Blue-green soldier pines cover the mountains of Great Week. Orkmund was once covered in forest, but the timber was used extensively for shipbuilding, and in Harlow too, were extensive forest, but they were cut down by the Ironborn of Old for use in shipbuilding. Nisiros, unlike other volcanic islands in the Aegean Arc, is actually more fertile. The soil holds enough moisture, which makes the land ideal for trees. The terrain of the island is not level, it has a considerable inclination, which made the farming of the land quite difficult. And this, to me, sounds very close to what we know about the Iron Islands. The second thing we know is that they are rich in iron, lead, and tin ores. I'm gonna start with tin, because more than 99% of tin production is from ore deposits directly or indirectly related to granitic rocks, meaning granites and their volcanic and subvolcanic equivalents. Volcanoes, directly or indirectly, produce or host deposits of various minerals, and some calderas host rich ore deposits. Metal rich fluids can circulate through the caldera forming hydrothermal ore deposits of metals such as lead, that we know iron islands have plenty. And that leaves us with iron. The amount of iron on the isles is huge, and one of the things that came into my mind are the giant deposits of Kiruna-type iron, whose origin have been debated for a century now. In 2019, a team of scientists provided new data stating that Kiruna-type ores are dominantly magmatic in origin. All these deposits are volcanic in origin, and with this geography and geology of the area, I doubt there isn't volcanic activity there. And we can guess that something is going on because of their myths too. With the living fire of Naga, the Grey King was keeping his hole warm. This sounds like geothermal energy to me. We know Winterfell has the same way of heating. We are also told that Naga could drown whole islands in her wrath. Considering there is a caldera, I'm guessing there was a collapse after an explosion, since we can see that the area was one or two big islands before. Naga was the volcano. In the theory about the high towers, I said that the breaking of the arm caused a situation similar to the Bronze Age collapse, and during the time we know of volcanic eruptions, along with everything else. One of the biggest was the eruption in Thera, which caused the collapse of many huge civilizations, such as the Minoan one. There were non-first men people on the western coast of Westeros before the breaking, and Iron Islands have one of the older, if not the oldest, castle in Westeros. Pike. Some say that the island is called Pike because of the castle. It is so ancient that no one can say with certainty when it was built nor who built it. Like the sea stone chair, its origins are lost. Pike at some point was as other castles, built upon solid stone on a cliff overlooking the sea with a wall and keeps and towers. Ironborn say that they did not come to these holy islands from godless lands across the sea, and Dark Maester Harig once advanced the interesting notion that the ancestor of the Ironborn came from some unknown lands west of the Sunset Sea. 
they're talking about lost greatness and riches. When battle was joined upon the shores, mighty kings and famous warriors fell before the ravers, like wheat before a skith, in such numbers that the men of the green lands told each other that the ironborn were demons risen from some watery hell, protected by fell sorceries and possessed of foul black weapons that drank the very soul of those they killed. They are talking about salt kings and ravers who made the sunset see their own. Stories about Dagon Dram the Necromancer, Rothgar of Pike and his Kraken summoning horn, and Balon Blackskin who fought with an axe in his left hand and a hammer in his right, and no weapon made of a man could harm him. Swords glanced off and left no mark and axes shattered against his skin. Ironborn! Were Valyrians before Valyrians? They called them the wolves of the sea, but I would say they were the dragons of the sea, but instead of dragons, they had their ships. Like the Valyrians, they had slaves that made them mine, and they had so much reach and power. The drowned god is said to have made the Ironborn in his own likeness, to rave, rape, carved out kingdoms, and make their names known in fire and blood, and to hold dominion over all the waters of the earth. The flame was brought by drowned god from the sea, and it proclaims rising tide, the time for the Ironborn to sail and go forth into the world with fire and sword as he did. The fiery element is way too prominent to not be important. Fire from an underwater drowned god, and the only thing that comes to my mind is a collapsed volcano. Valyrian power source was the fourteen flames. Ironborn of old had many commonalities, but they say that their god is drowned. So a volcano that collapsed in its caldera, since they say drowned. It fits the bill just right. The last kiss of Rolor is almost identical with the kiss of life, so there is a big chance Ironborn of old were doing fiery resurrections like Thoros. Even the description of Balon Blackskin sounds way too much with what Mokoro did at Victarion's hand, and Mokoro is a fire priest. And I think the chapter where Mokoro met Victarion gives us even more clues. Victarion's crew fished a fire priest from the sea, and the first thought he was was that the drowned god had sent him a gift. When Vol presented Mokoro, he said the same thing. Lord Captain, this is Mokoro, a gift to us from the drowned god. The drowned god sure has a habit of gifting them with fiery gifts. After healing his arm, Victarion described it as smoking, coal black, cracking and hard, yet the arm was stronger than it had ever been. He said that two gods are with him now, and no foe can stand before two gods. He could hear the drowned god from the depths of the sea, but he was feeling the red lord too. Victarion closed his burnt hand into a mighty fist and said, Giscaridon is no fit name for a ship of the Iron Fleet. For you, wizard, I shall rename her Red God Roth. Roth, a word that we don't see that often in the books. We see it, but it's not that much, and it's often used to describe someone when angry, obviously. The very few times we have seen the word not being used for characters, it was about the drowned god's wrath, Naga's wrath, the red god's wrath, the wrath of the Valyrians and the dragons, and the wrath of the old gods on Stannis. And the reason I point out that they talk about Stannis is because he's a character with both Grey King and Azura High traits. I think that when the breaking of the arm took place, along with everything else, there was an eruption too. Everything inside the story is pretty much a piece of a domino, reaching into the current timeline. And I think it was the case at that point too. We are told the children broke the arm. Maybe the people there also did something that caused the volcano to erupt, like the Valyrians. I have said in a previous uh, theory that Valyria was an Atlantis parallel, and the Iron Islands too fit this archetype, maybe even more than Valyria. To continue my previous theory from the High Towers episode, when the breaking happened, they were reaching for a place to stay, and this is not something that is going on for a couple of years. It's something that can be for a decade, or even more. Most likely the majority of the original people that left from the area were already dead, and many of the people were born in the mainland or in the sea since they were pretty much on the move. I imagine the Grey King was someone from the older inhabitants. He was a person that continued to teach them their culture since we know he taught them how to sail, how to build ships. He was the one that took them to the Iron Islands with a weirwood ship. He had a driftwood crown and throne and hall, 
like the salt kings have now. The stone chair and pike were whatever was left in the area, so they found them there. Salt and stone are two of the most important aspects of the religion and culture. They say that they were not first men, that they were people from the West, and if this is the case, it makes sense. While in Westeros, during the collapse, they were the people from the West. They were the people closer to fish than men for the people that were not familiar with sailing. And it was something that stuck. When they went back to Iron Islands, they still were the people from the West, but with time, the stories got jumbled, since they don't have written history. Now, I'm gonna talk about their black weapons for a moment. This thing sounds a lot like Valyrian steel, but I'm not sure if it is. Was the way of forging Valyrian steel lost twice? I don't know. It could be also normal steel, dyed or forged with specific tempering or forged with specific additions. They do have the line bless him with steel and we know they are extremely good at metallurgy and it makes sense. They have rich iron ores but not copper. So maybe they have found other alloys. That being said, I'm gonna put a theory that is maybe a little bit out there. In a Game of Thrones, we have this line from Tyrion. Dragonbone is black because of its high iron content. The book told him it is strong as steel, yet lighter and far more flexible, and of course utterly impervious to fire. As I said in the beginning, they must have seen a dragon and probably killed it too. If this is the case, I imagine they used the dragon bone, because it sounds like a very good weapon material. Dothraki use it along with other people on Essos, and it's very expensive. We are told that the crown of the Grey King was from Naga's teeth, but also from Pale Weirwood. So I'm guessing it was Weirwood like the boat. Thing is, the sigil of House Grey Iron has the head of the Sea King on Grey, and we are told that the Grey King ruled the sea itself, and the Salt King was king on the sea, so a sea king. But the crown he wears is black, not white. The Grey King was High King, not only a Salt King. We know that the Grey Irons had iron crowns too. I am guessing there were two crowns, as we know there were two thrones, Sea Stone and Driftwood, two halls, Pike and the White Hall that was probably the ship, two kings, Rock and Salt, so I'm guessing there were two crowns, one for each aspect, a black and a white, because the Grey King was the king of both, salt and stone. Since the Ironborn don't have written history to this day, the stories got mixed up with time. As it is the case with most myths and legends, there are many alternations and different versions depending on who says the story. My guess is that there was a dragon there, since the islands look volcanic, the Grey King killed it and carved its likeness on the boat, as well as gave its name. The Drown God, their power source that gave them fiery gifts from the sea, that brought his wrath down on people when angry, and made them in his likeness to rave with fire, sounds like a collapsed volcano to me. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> Oof, that was it for today. I feel like I'm forgetting stuff, but also that I put way too much information, and it's going to be boring. Um, all the papers I use the sources are down below and if you are into magmatic metals, they are actually very interesting. I think most of them are open and accessible without a Science Direct or Scopus account, so you can check them out if you want. Thank you very much for watching, I hope you enjoyed it and if you did, subscribe, press a like and tune in for the next one. I am between the Lovecraft video and a video about Dragonbinder and the rest of the Magical Horns, so if you have a preference, write down below. Bye.